so the next presentation is me and what it says up on the board here. Uh, we're going to be talking about what's called uh, light pollution. I prefer to talk about it more as a nighttime conservation. But uh, um, so, in, in in basic overview of this topic, a lot of you have probably seen graphics that look like this. This is a this isn't a photo of the United States. It's a uh, rendering of what, uh, uh, modeling actually, of what the man-made light shining out into the environment is like at night. This is from 1994. The data used for this is from weather satellites, and this is the these are the first years where we had digital data like this from the uh, Department of Defense and their weather satellites. We can take models like this, we don't, don't have that digital data to see what the skies and the nighttime conditions were like from years before this, but we can uh, look at actual readings that were made of the brightness of sky in various places at various times, and we can regress this. Um, I'm gonna take it back 30 years from this 1994 date to uh, 1964, and this is approximately what the nighttime skies would have looked like 30 years prior. So what we're seeing here is a real change. This isn't a little thing you have to stare at it much to see, oh, there's a little change here and there. This is like an explosion that happened in outdoor lighting during that period. And what caused it? Oh, I should preface this by saying I've been looking at this issue since almost then. I grew up in the, these eras and uh, I watched the sky go away. I've been looking at it seriously as a cause as a, uh, an effort to do something about it for like 15 years or so now. So you're going to be hearing my take on these things. Um, what caused this is really very simple. It's a change in technology pretty much. We went from the 1950s and 60s being lit by dimmer mercury vapor lights and even still incandescent lights outdoors and even fluorescent lights in some places to the more ubiquitous yellowish sodium, high pressure sodium street lights. They're much brighter. They make more light for the amount of electricity they consume. So instead of keeping the light levels the same as they were in the 60s and using less energy with these more efficient lights, we just made everything a lot brighter. So of course there's also new street lights added in this period too because you very rarely take out street lights, you just put in new ones. Uh, so why does this matter at all? Um, this is the main thing I want to touch on today before I challenge you all to do something about it. Um, we can break down five major issues of things that are affected by this artificial light out in the environment at night. And I'm gonna put these in no particular order because the priority would depend on who you are and what your, your priorities are, or what your community's priorities are. Um, we'll start out with energy waste because that's a simple one and we can break that down into questions like, are we putting the right amount of lighting out there? If we're putting out twice as much light as we need, we're using twice as much energy as we need. That's simple physics. If we're using, if we're making it 8% brighter than it needs to be, we're using 8% more energy. So again, pretty simple physics. Um, next question is, are we wanting the lights when we don't really need them? Um, do we turn on the lights over a parking lot or over a road or whatever? when there's traffic there and there's activity there, or do we have them go on when the sun sets and turn off in the morning when the sun comes back up? We can ask, um, are we only lighting what areas need to be lit? Um, if we need to light up this parking lot, are we also lighting up the properties on either side of them and down the street and things like that too that aren't our target area that needs to be lit? And the top of the list for energy waste in outdoor lighting is the efficiency of fixtures. So let's look at that kind of really quickly here. Here's a light fixture you can buy today. Here's a street light you can buy today. Um, it looks like a street light. I mean, it's a, you plug it in and it goes on. So it, it's an appliance that uses electricity and we're used to the idea of our energy consuming devices these days being rated for how efficient they are. We see these yellow stickers everywhere, whether you buy a computer printer or a washing machine, you buy your car, it's got that sticker on it that says how many miles per gallon it should get, how much it'll cost you to run it for a year, things like that. For outdoor lighting, the uh, efficiency rating system looks like, oh, there is no efficiency rating for outdoor lighting. I'm sorry, I was leading you down a path there, so there, there is no efficiency rating. Um, we can figure it out. Here's the cut sheet on that light. You'll notice from the 
manufacturer's catalog, there's no yellow sticker on there that talks about energy efficiency. Uh, there is, on the other hand, a big data set that the manufacturer provides that has the photometric data for this light fixture. And they have to provide that for the lighting designers who need to be able to calculate how many light poles to put in, at what spacing, with what wattage lamps in them to provide the illumination they need. But we can take that data and put it into other software, which gives us a view that looks something like this. The colored disc there is actually a sphere. It's the sphere of light coming off of the street light. And it's divided up into zones. So down in the lower left is this green quadrant. That's the light that's heading toward the street that this pole is next to. So it's heading down and out and across the street. And then the table on the right-hand side of that indicates to us the amount of the light that the lamp inside that fixture is creating that goes into that area. So it's telling us in this case that a little less than a quarter of the light that the lamp makes is going down into that green zone to light up the street. Behind there is the yellow quadrant. It's got a little light blue at the bottom of it. That's the light going into the yard of the house along that street, away from the street there. And the little light blue spot in the bottom is what's theoretically shining down on the sidewalk of that street, so where the pedestrians might be. So that could be useful light. But we see in that backward zone there that almost a quarter of the light from the lamp is going there. Then there's this dark blue band across the middle, which is really inaccurately small. This is the lighting industry's um, breakdown of directionality of light. That's their glare zone. The glare zone should really extend downwards much farther down. Oh, my laser's almost run out here. Um, it should be much deeper than that because light that shines out horizontal down the block does really nothing to illuminate the street. It's really only effective down at lower angles. But in any case, they still admit that 11% of the light from the lamp is going into the glare zone. And then we have the topper, the entire upper red hemisphere, which is light, which is 100% wasted. So that energy is 100% wasted. It's going into the sky. It's lighting up the bottoms of birds and airplanes and clouds and things, and that serves no public good. And for this fixture, half the light, 49.9% of the light from the lamp is going upward and directly being wasted. So talking about energy efficiency again, how would you rate this lamp, which you can buy today? It's, it's horrible, but it doesn't matter what the light bulb is inside of that lamp. Um, half of the energy being wasted is half of the energy being wasted. And what does that mean? Well, somebody's paying for the energy, first off, if that's what matters to you. If it's street lighting, it's probably taxpayers paying for it. If it's uh, anybody paying for it, there's an environmental cost to wasting electricity, too, from whatever method was used to generate electricity. So the conclusion here is in the yellow there, Today, it isn't the light bulb. We're so used to indoors worrying about whether we've got the newest light bulb that's being the most efficient. Outside, efficiency isn't determined by the light bulb, it's determined by how good the fixture is at putting the light it makes down where it's needed. So we'll go on to uh, safety and security. We have, we put up lights to be able to be active at night and we want to be safe and we want to be secure while we're doing our nighttime activities. Well, here's a street light. It must make it must make that street safer because it's a light and it's a street light and you know it's kind of glary though it's kind of like these lights shining at me if you hold your hand up to block the glare maybe you can see a little bit more and oh then you might notice that there's actually somebody standing under the street light that you couldn't see without holding your hand up to block the glare from the street light because it's so poorly designed so uh this is just one example but believe me it's really true that Good lighting can help us at night. It can enable us to move, be more active. It can make us safer and more secure. But bad lighting can do just the opposite. It can actually make it worse for our visual process to see what we're doing. So uh, this uh, second consideration with where bad lighting comes from. Environmental disruption, I think I would probably put at the top of the list for myself personally now, now that I've been studying this for quite a few years. Um, to really quickly get the concept across, I think most people would understand that if you took a nice natural meadow and you turned it into a uh, shopping mall, you'd be doing a lot of environmental disruption there. You're taking this natural situation and you're totally upending it. But we don't tend to think as much about the fact that if you take an area 
that has a natural cycle of darkness at night and light in the daytime, and you make it light in the daytime and perpetual twilight all night long, you're also creating a tremendous amount of environmental disruption. And uh, we are very daytime oriented as uh, human beings. Uh, we, if it's not daytime out, we turn out a bunch of lights to make it. So it's kind of like daytime out. That's our instinct to do that. Uh, and uh, what we, we have to remember is that um, that's not true for the rest of the living things on the planet. I have a lot of papers that uh, where research is done to look for the effects of man-made light in ecosystems and on organisms. And I will say out of hundreds of studies that I have, um, that I have read, I haven't found a single one that found no impact from man-made light out in, in ecosystems and on organisms. Usually it's the other way around. The uh, impacts are quite notable. They're quite substantial. So uh, the thing to remember again is for billions of years and the millions of years that all the things that are living today on the planet have evolved over, there was night with nothing more than starlight and periodic moonlight and light, sunlight during the daytime, and that was the cycle of things, and it's just in the last blink of an eye, uh, geological history-wise, we've been upending that by making it light all night long. What about health concerns? Uh, we're animals too. Um, does having too much light at night affect us? I, I usually tell people that I think if you studied human physiology 30 years ago, um, or 40 years ago, your textbook probably wouldn't have said much at all about photosensitivity in human beings. Um, it wasn't really a too notably studied topic. In the last 20 years, there's been a lot of research which has uh, upended that and shown, demonstrated how very photosensitive we are and that too much exposure to light at night could be very upsetting to our uh, physiology. And uh, I think we're really just at the door opening stage of understanding that. And there's a lot of research going on to try to quantify how much we're talking about. So there's potentially concerns about our own health too. I'm gonna to put, uh, no, as I say, we're more light sensitive than we used to think, or that we maybe we want to think. We don't want to think that turning on lights at night could be possibly bothering our health, but maybe we should start thinking about that some. I've got as number five, the last on list is dark skies, and that may be at the top of your list. It may not be on your list at all. If you live in an urban area and don't really think about it, most people would think that uh, this really only matters to professional astronomers who are trying to study the universe and who are having basically the window blinds drawn over the view of the universe by the ever-increasing light pollution on the Earth that keeps us from being able to see the entire rest of everything. But I would pose this as just a, something to think about as far as keeping the skies dark and being able to see the stars. I ask, what if Galileo had never seen the stars in the sky? Or what if Isaac Newton or Albert Einstein had never seen the stars in the sky? Or the people who put us on the moon? Again, what if they had never seen the stars? What if uh, Shakespeare had never seen the stars? Or Van Gogh had never seen the stars in the sky? Well, this is the state we're at now, actually. Uh, there's 80% of the people on the planet live in places where they really can't see the stars in the sky at night. So we're taking this away from our society, and we know that since time immemorial, for the whole history of our species, the sky has been this window to something beyond ourselves. And uh, now it's, if you walk outside in Milwaukee, uh, at night to night, well, if the clouds were gone, you'd look up and you'd see three or four stars, and that view is gone, that, uh, that window isn't, isn't open anymore. And I think that that's actually something to be concerned about. So no one can see the stars anymore, that's, that's an issue. So we have these five main problems, Then the question is, again, what are we doing wrong that's causing these problems. Well, we can go back to this image of that really badly designed light fixture that's, for some reason or another, like sending half of its output straight up into the sky and wasting another quarter of it in places where it doesn't belong. Um, that's really straightforward. We should be able to think of when we put up a light, 
there's some, some activity that we're doing that we're trying to provide light for, and light that goes anywhere else is either wasted or and or problematic for some reason or another, because where it goes where it doesn't belong, light becomes pollution instead of being a useful thing. So this is one factor about where light pollution comes from. It's not the only one. Thinking of it as the only one leads to the creation of this illustration, which probably some of you have seen, because it gets published around the place. I've really come to hate this illustration <laughs> a lot, and it's because it oversimplifies the issue. I made my own version of it for a talk a couple of years ago, and it looks like this. He takes all of those first four things in the top illustration and says, these are all bad. And the reason they're bad is because there's a white light bulb in the lamp. And uh, you uh, can't address light pollution in any serious manner without talking about the color of the light, the spectral quality of the light that we're talking about dumping into the environment. It's like talking about water pollution. It's what are you dumping into there? The top one is that of the uh, high pressure sodium light which is primarily just yellow light. It's got a little green and a little blue, or a little red in it there, but it's primarily that bright yellow lines. Um, the bottom four are white LEDs, like the kind you will find commonly in outdoor lighting now. What you have there is a lot more short wave light coming out, a lot more green, and then into the blue, especially coming out in those LED lights. That's what makes them appear more white to the eye, because they have a more balanced spectrum. What's the trouble with blue light? Um, well, there's a photoreceptive chemical called uh, melanopsin, and it's, we have it in the retinas of our eyes. It doesn't contribute to our visual system, but it tells, it's connected to the very primitive, the reptile part of our brain, and it tells our brain whether it's day or night. Uh, and, and our brain can, uh, the, has, triggers the uh, formation of melatonin, which you've heard of, which signals tells the whole rest of the body it sends that message around it's nighttime you should be resting uh, you should go into rest mode sleep mode so this isn't just a human thing uh, melanopsin was discovered in frog skin before it was found in the human eye frogs can tell whether it's day or night through their skin their skin is light sensitive um, it's been found in algae it's been found all across uh, several kingdoms of living things. It's an incredibly archaic, very, very uh, ancient photoreceptive chemical, and it's only sensitive to blue light. And that kind of makes sense from an evolutionary sense. Um, it's blue out when it's daytime. Even if it's cloudy, the sky is blue, basically. In the shade, it, you're still getting more blue light. So it's a great thing to use for a trigger of whether it's day or night. You could use that for your photo cell you know, putting out to see whether it's day or night, but why don't you stick with blue and that, that helps. So that's an issue there. Blue light is biologically extremely active. Um, here's Rayleigh scattering. This is what makes the sky blue. When you shine red light out, up and through the sky, it'll just keep on going. When you shine blue light, it scatters. So if we shine enough blue light at night up in the sky, it wants to turn the sky blue like it is in the daytime. The, the glow spreads out, the light scatters. So if we're shining up more blue light in the sky, we're gonna get much more sky glow than we do with shining longer wavelengths up into the sky. Here I also tossed in as another item here, glare response. The human eye glare response is heavily blue sensitive. So you might know, notice why some headlights make you squint more than other ones do. And it's generally because the whiter ones have a lot more blue in them. So they trigger that, both the discomfort and even the disability glare issues with the eye to have more blue in the light. Um, here's this in practice. There's a county in Washington State that was going to do a countywide refit of their street lighting. So most of the street lighting that was there was anywhere from 10, 20, 30, 40, even 50 years old. Most of it was high pressure sodium. A lot of it was in old fixtures which wouldn't be considered dark sky friendly. They have the hanging globes and things like that. The new fixtures, which they're going to do a countywide switch out in, our white LEDs, they're in dark sky friendly fixtures that only shine downward. So you would think that when these folks did this study to measure the actual sky brightness over the county before and after the switch out, 
they would have found a notable improvement and they found a notable degradation. The uh, bottom illustration here showing the, this is a sky-wide panorama of the uh, relative intensity of the sky glow over these, this county area. In the bottom one, you can just visually see that the explosion there of sky glow is notably larger than the top one. That's after the switch out. So the switching to better fixtures that shone light downward didn't make up for the also switching to white light, which bounces off the ground and shines up in the sky and creates tremendous, tremendous more sky glow. So that's that in practice. Um, let's talk briefly about US lighting standards, and that can be really brief because there, there are no US lighting standards for outdoor lighting. Um, there are these things called recommended practices, which you will see referenced. Any of you who have worked in lighting of any sort, or even peripherally read about it, will have, or will, if you do, will run into the RPs, or recommended practices, that are developed by the IES, which is a trade group, a lighting engineering trade group, and we are using their recommendations in most places for how bright to make a parking lot or a street or a sidewalk or a basketball court for that matter. Um, I will say that IES RPs are uh, not necessarily uh, developed in the most scientific way or the most data-driven way. They're generally done by consensus. And I was literally told this by someone who was on a committee who said they went into a parking lot and just looked at each other and said, do you think this looks bright enough? And they said, they agreed, yeah, it looks bright enough. And that became the recommended practice for parking lot lighting. And this is how we're doing things in this country. And uh, I will add again another personal note for me that uh, lighting engineers tend to see the solution to every problem anywhere on the planet to be adding more, <laughs> adding more lighting. And that's really the truth. They don't ever stop and say, wait a minute. Why are we talking about lighting this up in the first place? It just doesn't happen. So, uh, um, so again, let's look at that in practice. We look at all these roadways and uh, why are they as bright as they are? Well, nobody really knows, actually. There's not data-driven uh, analysis that says there will be this many accidents if these roads are lit to this level and that many if they're lit to this level. And it just doesn't happen that way. The other the question I would ask about these pictures is, where the hell are the cars? Um, if any of these roadways needed to be lit this much, it would actually increase their safety at rush hour at 7.30 p.m., say, to have this level of lighting. Why are these lights still on at all or on at this brightness at whatever hour this is when there's not a single vehicle out of the road? Um, does this make any sense at all? Is this good lighting practice? I don't think so. I'm going to sort of end on a a uh, story that shows that we can do better. So this is the town of Flagstaff, Arizona, which for almost 50 years now has been working at controlling its outdoor lighting, regulating its outdoor lighting, to try to help preserve the sky. And they've been very successful at it. This is the same sort of analysis of sky glow done for, we have uh, Flagstaff in the top illustration there of the sky over it, and down in the lower half is one of Cheyenne, Wyoming, Cheyenne was picked because it's the, the population is exactly the same as Flagstaff. And it's also kind of set off by itself. It's not in a big urban area with a lot of other municipalities running into it there. There's 11 times more light in the sky over Cheyenne than there is over Flagstaff. And it isn't that they don't have lights in Flagstaff. Um, I've been in downtown Flagstaff a lot at night. Um, it's a college town, but you go on Saturday night when it's dark out, and it's just throngs of people. It's, it's very well lit. You can see what you're doing. It's just that it's lit properly. Um, it's lit uniformly. They use the warm colored light, the amber lighting. Uh, there's no glaring lights in your face. And they're all directed down toward the ground. And just by doing those fairly simple things, this is from Buffalo Park, where we do a yearly uh, public star party with the telescopes out there. Buffalo Park's in the city limits of Flagstaff. And this is the sky over Buffalo Park. So um, it works. So we can do a lot better job. Um, and I'll th finish on my challenge to, uh, to the creative hacker crowd of the world <laughs> with things that we need to do yet. Um, there's a ton of research that needs to be done, both uh, figuring out techniques for research and, and ways to go with things, um, figuring out how to measure sky glow better, 
how to measure these impacts, how to measure the issues with different light sources. Um, this map, this is the more current um, model of brightness over the lower 48 states. This is from 2015 data. The satellite that the data comes from, that this map is derived from, is that the imagers in it are functionally blind to blue light. They're made to image for weather imaging and they don't want the scattering that you get a blue light in their nighttime imaging. So they're blind to blue light and we need to see what this blue light is shining in the sky. All you're seeing in these images is basically the longer wavelengths of light. So this is not a really good indication on the level of sky glow, but it's what we've got. We need better satellites, so anybody who wants to build a better satellite, um, you can come and see me. Um, there's a tremendous amount of data mining that could be done. There's already lots of data out there about everything from ecological issues, human health things, safety issues like those roadway things. The data is out there, and there's also data about light pollution and um, lighting systems and things. There's a lot of correlation that could be done to uh, provide good research. To, give us more tools to work with. Um, this whole question of roadway safety, so by far more fatal accidents happen on the roadways during the daytime at night, but your odds of having an accident at night are higher, and that has always been blamed on it being dark. Well, of course, you have more accidents at night because it's dark, so what we do is we put in street lights. But the reality is it's well known now that roadway accidents are heavily influenced by alcohol, and by fatigue. And it's also known that both of those things are much more prevalent at night than they are during the daytime. So how much of the nighttime increase in accidents per mile driven is because it got dark, and how much of it is because of these other issues? And does the lighting help these other issues at all? Again, there's data out there on these things, but it needs to be analyzed more. Um, I have thousands, literally, of papers looking at light at night issues from all across these different fields from health to uh, engineering to ecological things. Um, we don't have one good resource set up. We could definitely use some help with uh, uh, creating libraries that researchers could use if say if you're working on health and you're also interested in well I wonder how this affects the animals. You know these things I'm looking at human health. It'd be great to be able to pull these things together. So I see a real need for that. And then finishing up, there's a lot of re or always need for outreach things. We need web development. We need uh, video creation and things like that to tell these stories more effectively in places, in the halls, in the halls of power where they matter, so we can get things done. So I will uh, finish up by showing my contact information. Um, I don't want to take time now to open up for questions. I think I've probably eaten my time. Oh, right, up, right about to the minute. So um, that's me, uh, Drew at IllinoisLighting.org. That's one of the organizations that I'm in, my Illinois branch. Um, contact me or see me after when you see me around here or something or other. I would be glad to answer questions, discuss things more, or recruit people who would actually like to join in on this, uh, this effort. So thank you very much for your attention.